Good afternoon. Uh, we're really excited to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Cristoban Martinez, and uh, I'm an artist in post commodity. My name is Raven Chacon. Uh, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I'm a composer by trade and uh, a member of post commodity since 2009. Um, we also want to uh, introduce our, our colleague and collaborator in post-commodity, uh, Cade Twist. Uh, he can't be here with us today, but um, he, his voice is definitely amongst us and, um, and present with us. Um, so uh, I just want to provide just a brief context about who we are. Um, post-commodities art functions as a shared indigenous lens and a voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, uh, public perceptions, beliefs, uh, individual uh, actions uh, that comprise the ever-expanding uh, multinational, multiracial, and multi-ethnic colon colonizing force uh, that is defining the 21st century through ever-increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. Uh, our work, um, uh, post-commodity works to uh, forge new metaphors capable of rationalizing our shared experiences within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment, promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies, and connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with the broader public sphere. And like Ghana Think Tank, we are a, a collective of three, and we are based in different cities uh, in the southwest. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Cristobal is in the Phoenix area, and Cade is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we all come from different uh, tribes and tribal backgrounds, and also different work in different uh, mediums and, and different have different practices outside of post-commodity. Um, what we'll start with, and what we'll mainly be talking about today, is our project Repellent Fence, which we completed last year. Um, in 2007, Post Commodity became fascinated with these commercial bird products, uh, we, after seeing one at a, a Home Depot. What they are is these, uh, here's, here's the Amazon ad, uh, these 10 inch diameter balloons uh, that you put in your yard, and, and they're intended to, to uh, you know, you put them in your tree, or you, or you hang them from somewhere, and they're supposed to scare away, you know, pigeons. And we figured that if a 10-inch diameter balloon can, can scare away a pigeon, perhaps a 10-foot diameter balloon could ward off Western civilization. So, um... The, the magic about these balloons is that um, if, if you have this bird problem, uh, usually people uh, will go and buy one of these balloons because there's pigeons that are making a mess in their driveway. And so uh, they'll go, they'll buy the balloon, they'll hang it up, and then uh, the, the, the birds will, will go away. But then um, you, you, prob you come back a, a few hours later and you find that the birds have, uh, have realized the ineffectuality of, of the design, and so they've come back and now they're having a party on the balloon and, and shot all over the balloon as, as well. And so, um, so this, um, this, this uh, idea or this vehicle embodies this narrative of uh, fast capitalism and the idea that uh, products are embedded with, uh, or designed with embedded obsolescence. And, and back to the design of the balloon, what, what attracted us to this is uh, a couple of things. The, the colors all have significance in each of our tribes, you know, representing either the directions or, for myself, sacred mountains um, or, or worlds of emergence. And uh, in, Cade, in Cade's uh, tribe, it's a, it represents certain kinds of medicine. And also these concentric circles were, were an iconography that uh, we have learned that is from tribes all through the Americas, from Canada down to, to South America. And uh, this is particularly important because what, what these symbols um, uh, represent is a currency that demonstrates a long view history of trade that has existed from the, the southern tip of South America all the way up into Canada. So, so for us, it was a, a indigenous ready-made, you know, perfect for 
for creating artworks with. So we started flying these as guerrilla actions. This one was flown over Sheriff Joe Arpaio's headquarters in Phoenix, Arizona. So it's very nearby the uh, arts center called the, the Ice House, and uh, we were able to stage that one evening. A few years later, we, as part of an exhibition called Close Encounters in Winnipeg, Canada, uh, we worked with Manitoba Hydro to be able to fly one in the lobby of their offices. Manitoba Hydro being the, uh, the institution that, um, and company that, that manages the water in Manitoba, which is a province that has the most water, but is also responsible for flooding native lands in that area. So this one being more of a reminder of, uh, of everyone's uh, responsibility to manage our natural resources and, and to be accountable for those. So the idea was to put these balloons in these different contexts and different political situations, just so that we could understand, well, what do they do? What do these balloons do out in the world? And how, how, do we, um, how can we learn to position them? How can we learn to position them as metaphors? Are they legible? And how do people respond? So all of this led to a project that uh, had started, really started when we started working with these balloons. And what we wanted to do was uh, do a project in our own homelands, the Southwest, and came up with the idea of having an intervention at the U.S.-Mexico border. So our, our plan was to create a fence which would go perpendicular to the existing U.S.-Mexico line, and this fence would be different in every way possible from the current fence. So in, in duration, in material, in direction, and in scale. And I think um, it, there, there's a part of, of this narrative that, that ties to narratives of, that Ghana Think Tank was, was sharing with us. And it's this idea that uh, social engagement can be a very stochastic process. And so I think at the very early stages, we, we were thinking of it as like you know, maybe a guerrilla action or something interventionist. But what, it really, um, what really happened with the project is that we, we, we began to learn as, as we started to to leverage our indigenous knowledge systems to think about how to solve these problems is that this, this project really became something that was uh, a manifestation of co-intentionality as opposed to intervention. Right, we, um, our intention was just to put up this fence and get everybody to wake up and be like, wow, you know, what, what, what the hell is this? And, um, and really just cause a disruption on that border and, and have this mockery of a fence. But, then we realized the fence is already a mockery of itself, and there's um, and and that the piece would start having other kinds of interpretations, especially depending where we decided to to put this on the border, and we're soon realizing that there's a lot of different communities along the border. When we first started trying to find a place for this, we were interested in doing it in the Tohono O'odham Reservation, which is also the Papago, uh, known as the Papago Indian Reservation, which is one of the few native communities which has uh, ex uh, recognized lands on both sides of the border. However, they, of course, like the rest of the borderlands, they are split uh, by a militarized zone. And when we uh, went to the, those people and, and uh, spoke to the tribe, they said, we're very interested in, in this statement that you're trying to make, but we don't want any more attention or, you know, in this area. And as we would go out into the desert there, we would notice we were being watched the whole time. You know, you feel alone, but then something's not quite right and you see a camera that, you know, should be a, a cactus or something. And, um, <laughs> So we, um, we started at the, at the western um, most part of um, uh, Arizona and Sonora and went all the way along the border and studied the entire border and visit, visited with communities all along the border. And um, from community to community, um, uh, uh, pe people uh, would oftentimes concede that they felt like our project was uh, an elegant idea and an exciting possibility, but um, totally untenable that, um, to achieve in the borderlands. That was true for all of those places except for here, where you have, where we encountered Minutemen and neo-Nazi <laughs> vigilantes who, uh, of course, didn't want this going on in their, in their neighborhood. But that was... Uh, 
So that was another concern about doing this project is all of, you know, at first we thought maybe it was going to be the federal government or the Border Patrol who was going to say no way. And then we encountered the Minutemen and then uh, we started hearing, of course, of what is probably more dangerous than all of them, the cartels that run uh, business in the area. So what we realized uh, as, as the process was unfolding is that we were actually looking for like this Goldilocks zone. This Goldilocks zone being where the socio-cultural and political situation had to be just right in order for something like this to exist. And uh, just when we were almost running out of hope and running out of border, um, <laughs> We, um, we came to the, the, the cities of uh, Douglas, uh, Arizona, and Agua Prieta, Sonora, and, which is, which is down, down over here. And um, what was really cool about Douglas and Agua Prieta is that um, both it, it's one city divided by a wall um, that is frustrated, that, that um, articulated a sense of frustration because they felt like their federal governments were not listening to them. And out of that frustration, the, the cities had created a, a memorandum of understanding. And that MOU was in order to try to mitigate the desocialization that the border was having on the peoples of that region, that they, would make, they made a promise to one another to try to figure out how to collaborate and work co-intentionally in a trans-border way. And so um, what, what we started to learn about our work is that our work became an opportunity uh, for the communities to operationalize their dreams and aspirations. Uh, we received funds from a Creative Capital Award. Uh, which we're very happy to get. And uh, in additionally to that, we were matched by funds from an organization called the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and uh, to, to start working on this project to manufacture the balloons and to uh, get helium uh, for this project. And what had happened was um, October 9th through 12th of last year, it went up. And we were, uh, we were able to, to have yeah. this. So um, what was um, beautiful to us about this work is that the cities of Douglas and Agua Prieta chose themselves for four days of indigenous reimagined ceremony, a time in which a, a, a memory, a new memory was reinscribed upon the land about a time before a border wall. And so uh, what this led to was this led to the communities coming together, crossing borders, working with each other. Um, this is at the federal level, at the state level, at the city level, at the uh, level of NGOs, uh, church organizations, citizens, to determine how to leverage all of the resources in order to create a, a unified work of art that would uh, represent the, the region. And so this... Um, a uh, repellent fence came to embody a narrative that was co-determined by the communities of Douglas and Agua Prieta, and that narrative is that they saw repellent fence or the definition of repellent fence as a suture, um, a, a way of, um, of healing and, and bringing the communities back together. And uh, just to wrap it up, it, it, it really was, there were a lot of obstacles in making this happen and every, you know whether it was getting helium across the border or uh, you know finding a place to stage our balloons as you saw that airplane hangar and every obstacle we came across the the community and the people of these communities uh, figured out a solution and uh, I'll just leave with this picture right here which is makes me smile every time so we we would really like to thank the communities of uh, Douglas and Agua Prieta for for their incredible uh, love and hospitality and courage and uh, we we also like to recognize and thank uh, creative capital uh, the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and and also we, we have a member of our audience who's here today uh, Roberto Bedoya who uh, was uh, director of Pima Arts Council at the time. And um, he, he was one of the, the very first uh, people we approached with, his, with this concept. And 
uh, I think there's a lot of stories around that. I think he thought we were completely nuts, but yet at the same time, he, he has an incredible vision and an incredible love, and he encouraged us, and he pr provided us with a lot, of, a lot of knowledge and a lot of insight as to how to move forward with an idea like this. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.